You're listening to the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, Episode 1. This episode, I'm talking with marine biologist and four-time Emmy Award-winning filmmaker Rick Rosenthal. Rick has filmed on several of the landmark nature films of our time, including the BBC's outstanding series Planet Earth and Blue Planet, as well as its Life series. Underwater camera work played an essential part in Rick's marine research. Aiming to share his observations with the wider world, Rick turned to filmmaking and television. He has since gone on to film some of the most challenging wildlife subjects on our planet in over 35 films. Among them are three award-winning programs on the Great Whales, Riddle of the Right Whale, Humpback Whales and Sperm Whales Back from the Abyss, all shot for the BBC. Rick also produced Hot Tuna and Superfish Bluefin Tuna with international production and distribution company Wild Logic. The films are narrated by Sir David Attenborough and are currently airing on television worldwide on the National Geographic Channel and Nat Geo Wild. Rick recently completed The Dark Side of the Ocean, a one-hour film in HD and 4K, and it's screened this year at the International Wildlife Film Festival, which is where I caught up with Rick to sit down and ask him a few questions. So Rick, thanks so much for agreeing to be on the show um, and sitting with me here at the uh, International Wildlife Film Festival 2016 in Missoula, Montana. Rick, you are a multi-award winning cinematographer and you're also a marine biologist. Can you give me a little bit of background on your, your marine biologist background, but also how you got into filmmaking? Well, I came into filmmaking uh, a, a different door, and it was through science, marine biology. And that was my passion for many years, and particularly in diving biology, and growing up in San Diego County along the coast there, and uh, working at first with Westinghouse Ocean Research Laboratory and the submarines, and you know, it was kind of a dream job. You're a marine biologist, and, and hey, you want to dive in a submarine today and go 4,000 feet? And then um, I got working on higher degrees in San Diego in biology, and I went over to Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And again, that was one of the, uh, you know, to, to, a, to a biologist, that was the pinnacle. If you get to Scripps, you know, you're in a laboratory, you hang your wetsuit up, you're out there diving, rubbing elbows with all the diving biologists on the west coast of North America. And it was a small group in the 1960s mid-60s, uh, we knew each other. The world knew each other then in terms of who was a diving biologist and really working on their hands and knees and on reefs, coral reefs, kelp forests, bays. And, uh, and then I, I uh, had a research grant to go to Alaska and study the sea otters up there that had been transplanted. And I went up on the wild coast of southeast Alaska and not in the inside passage, but on the outer coast of the Pacific where it's big water, nobody up there. I mean, for a week or so, we saw nobody. And I took my diving skiff up there and uh, hauled it up on the ferry and uh, my young family. And we had a cabin out on the outer coast with the brown bears out there and this big brown bears in the water, the sea, stellar sea lions, which are enormous, and diving in areas that nobody else had even put their head underwater, reefs that nobody. And that just got the bug, you know. I mean, I really got fired up by seeing that coast where humans generally, are, the, 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 the word on the street of Alaska is cold and frozen and icy and whatever, but not the coast. It's like Canada, British Columbia, beautiful forested and thousands of square miles of, you know, you know beaches and coves and outer reefs and kelp forests and islands. That, and the world's fisheries were up there at the time you know, the biggest salmon fishery in the world, halibut fishery, ground fisheries. So to go up to Alaska, and I had a job offer then, amazing. When I was at Scripps, they came down, a firm, and said, do you want to go to Alaska? We'd like you to work on a big project up there. And uh, I moved up, dead of winter, leaving La Jolla, California, with beach and sandals, and went to Alaska in the dead of winter. I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, to, that, that's a big move, California to Alaska. So that was um, your marine biology uh, phase of your career, and then uh, and then you moved into filmmaking, 
with that. Can you explain a little bit about that transition as a marine biologist to a filmmaker? Well, while I was in Alaska, one of the things I did besides we had research projects and, and studying baseline ecology, the near shore fishes, the kelp forests, but also I was a, a consultant to the governor of Alaska on fishery problems and policy. And, and then I got asked by the University of Alaska to go out and do outreach, extension. There wasn't even a word like that to go to different villages and towns and give talks about the near shore Alaska. And because I was taking still photos in with our work, I'd see the people so fired up to see what their underwater world looked like. And I'd be in native villages to the capital in Juneau to Anchorage and, and realizing after writing a lot of research papers with my colleagues, myself, nobody's reading them. You know, your peers read them and that's about it. You know, you get 50 people to read them or request your, uh, uh, your publication. But, but the image the, 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 the interest you got, people fired up of seeing it on the screen. And at that time, I said, I got to make a change. I got to change things. And so I went, we moved back down to the States, and I started taking some classes at USC in California in their film department. But there was nobody in there doing documentary hard, and certainly at wildlife. I mean, it was all features. But, you know, I got a little background in it. And then in uh, when moving into San Diego again, that was more the home of underwater photography. If you look back historically, the top people came out of that area. We had the first diving clubs, and and I hadn't I hadn't entered that area. I was I came in at a different gate as as a marine biologist. So to get a mentor was really tough. You know, there was a few guys that were really well well known, world famous, working on features. They work with on James Bond or work with some of the other project programs and uh, Sea Hunt, you know, with the, on television, but nobody was willing to be your mentor. You had to kind of learn it. And that's the era of film, and it was film, film for years. And we were shooting 16 millimeter film. Now the younger people today didn't have to have that, didn't have that, don't have that experience. Uh, you, you couldn't look at your work. You know, you looked through a small viewfinder and you shot it and it was very expensive. You had a 10 minute roll of film and uh, it cost hundreds of dollars to buy the film and to process it. And then you looked at it and you realized, oh my God, I've screwed up. So it wasn't like the instant gratification and learning of video, whether it was tape or now tapeless. So it's tough and there weren't a lot of people doing it and the cameras were were good. The film stocks were slower. They, they didn't allow you to work in a lot of different environments uh, just because of the light levels and speed. So there were few of us doing it. And to get a break was pretty tough. Uh, National Geographic was in business and, and working with the top people in, in ge geographic specials. There was no Discovery Channel. PBS Nature had just started a little bit. However. But the group that was that was sort of driving it was in England, and it was the BBC in Bristol, the Natural History Unit, and in London in some uh, some way with uh, Partridge Films was starting at that time to get a name and um, survival Anglia Films. Those were the players. If you didn't break into that, you 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 just didn't go out and shoot on your own. You had to break in, and so I. Uh, I went to the BBC as an American, as a Yank, and with my diving skills and my biology skills. But the first thing they told me is, Rick, we're not a training school for cameramen. You know, you've got to get up to speed. You know, we see the best stuff in the world. We like what you do and your story, your ideas and your background, but it's the camera work. You've got to, you've got to really come, come up to speed. So I got a few assignments, very and way less money than I ever was getting as a marine biologist. I mean, one of my first assignments uh, to do a salmon film for BBC was $160 a day, and that included my complete camera kit, underwater gear, and good luck. And that was my first week of really shooting for the BBC um, on one of the, one of the, uh, the new series. 
and because I was lucky enough to have contacts in Alaska and British Columbia, I got some really good stuff. And they said, keep going. And, and so I did. Um, that was one of the, the major programs I work on. It was called Miracle of the Scarlet Salmon, about the sockeye salmon. Prior to that, I had some small assignments from, from the BBC. I'll back up. And one was a new series that was called Trials of Life. And that was a, that was a game changer for the BBC. At, they, they realized that after that, and they had co-produced that with the Turner, Ted Turner in Atlanta, and uh, they made a lot of money on that. Turner's group did on video, home box office. BBC woke up and said, oh my goodness, we have something here that's really marketable. Before it was sort of a club, you know, it was, and you didn't worry about the, what you, raising money. If there was a project, you went out and did it. But that, that awakened the BBC's business end that they hadn't, at least the natural history in it, that they had a commodity. They had something that was really valuable. And I happened to be right in there at the start of all that. And the David Attenborough series, you know, Life on Earth, Living Planet, and then from that sprung all these great series. So it really was a case that they wanted to see that you had what it took to create these great images to be able to work with you in the future. And I think that's a, a very valuable lesson um, still today. Um, how, what would you say um, for people who are just kind of trying to break into the industry, whether they're doing it independently or trying to intern or work with production companies and networks, do you think that's still a viable thing today to, to hone your craft before you go and, and um, speak to these networks um, or do you think the model has kind of changed? I wasn't young at the time I'd come in with I said a, a pretty solid marine biology background and lots of research papers and contacts and diving skills and boating skills uh, I I try to advise uh, people that want to come into the business is is yeah you know it's so tough First of all, right away, you got to learn. It's one of the toughest things to break into. There's only so many slots. But today, with the cameras the way they are, you can really uh, take some courses. You can experiment by yourself. You can go out and shoot and, and, and look. Don't do it all on your own, though. You've got to have mentors. You've got to have teachers or work with some groups. We generally pass uh, younger types around, and it's word of mouth. We rarely take someone based on uh, sending a resume if we don't know them because we're working in a field. It's really tight quarters, small groups. If we have one bad egg apple in the basket, it makes it impossible. And, and that's true of, of wildlife, natural history, uh, research, as well as filmmaking. So we're very careful about who we get and some of those skills that come in besides, oh, I know how to do camera work. The first thing I would ask was, was, do you smoke? And and if there was a long delay, we'd say, well, you do, and it just doesn't work in, in close quarter, especially on boats, unless you can hold it <laughs> together. Uh, the other thing we'd say, did you cook? Can you cook? And immediately, the gals would say, oh, my God, I'm going to be past, I'm going to be the end up the cook here. Instead, I would say, wait a minute, we've got guys that, carry around their own spice racks and they know how to cook because y'all we chip in and so we have we delegate different jobs and it somebody make we're out in a field camp somewhere on a boat somewhere you need that can you run an outboard motor can you run a small boat can you dive uh, you know how are you with the camera gear do you have some technical skills so not just shooting with a camera but come in with something else and I was always trying to promote not just camera work, but why don't you get into sound? I'd tell some people, you know, we need good sound recorders desperately that can go out in the field and are on our tough and can handle those conditions, especially out on a boat. You're out there and it's not, we're talking about in the open ocean and sea and we need good sound work, we need good camera work, as well as writers. I mean, there are, there are some other, there are other jobs within the business that are just as vital but come with some skills that will really help out the filmmaker, whoever's producing it. And they're gonna, you're going to be a lot happier. But it also, know right up front, 
You're going to be a Sherpa. You're going to carry gear. You're going to carry gear. You're going to be a grunt. And if you expect to start off as a producer, director of photography, uh, forget it. Uh, it may be a year and you're carrying gear. It used to be because of film, you didn't even get a chance to turn on the camera. You might set it up, you carried a tripod, but you weren't shooting because of the, the expense and the, uh, you know, everybody's job was sort of online to get the great shot. And, and so the assistants, assistant assistants, what, they weren't shooting. Now I, I'm really, uh, you know, encourage the younger types that work with me to shoot. And, and so they get something out of it too, whether they're taking stills or they're doing some, some video work. That doesn't mean it's theirs, but um, they, they gain a lot more out of it. So it's gain some other skills, uh, communication key to be able to, to interact with other people. You can be an oddball later when you make it, as we'd say in Hollywood or something, but not out in the field when you have to work with colleagues in tight quarters. And, and it, just, it just doesn't, we, we tolerate it for a bit, but we'd much rather have people that are really wanting it. I mean, the passion's got to be there. And you know it within the first week. We've had people where they just can't cut it in a week. They're carrying stuff up and down hills, and they're on beaches, they're on their knees getting seasick. And, and it's, the reality clicks in, they're not going to be Jacques Cousteau or you know, David Attenborough or whatever. I can go down the list of great cameramen uh, and, and filmmakers. But uh, the reality hits in that we're, you know, it's, it's a lot of labor. I think that is super, super valuable advice because I know from um, with my career working with National Geographic that we would travel around with very small crews of anything from three to five people and it was exactly that. It, unless you worked really well together and you're willing to chip in and do anything that it took to get the project done, it just wasn't going to work. And um, I know I, I would drive vehicles and lug the gear and... Um, you know, do whatever it took to make sure we got the project done. So I think that's, that's probably the most valuable advice that, um, that, that anyone looking to get into the industry could take on, on board. Now, you mentioned earlier about making mistakes, right? And we've, we've all been there, right? I think you only get good by making many mistakes. And you had mentioned, you know, um, over or under exposing and not knowing until the film was developed. Well, moving forward throughout your career, what kind of challenges have you faced and what kind of mistakes have you made that, that have really honed you into the great cinematographer that you are today? Cinematography, especially wildlife, uh, natural history, where you only get a chance, maybe one go at something, of, of a great sequence, of a great behavior that happens before you. And when you blow it, meaning the battery goes dead, camera jams. When we shot film, we'd have jam-ups. And if you had a jam-up in a on a film load and you couldn't get to your magazine and load another one or it just uh you know uh the weather you know it froze up or whatever and and you're crushed you you're like an american i played american football and and sports and and it's like on monday morning quarterback uh, critiques of how well you did and how well you didn't do you got to have thick skin really to take it and and in the past, when we projected our, you know, our, our work, our rushes, you'd have two producers sitting there, maybe at the BBC, in a room, in a projection room, looking at your work. You couldn't alter it. You couldn't change it. You couldn't dub it out. You couldn't uh, erase it. It was there on the big screen. And, oh, my God, did you get some pounding in the eye. Now, you know, in England, the British is, is more... I'd get a letter from something and saying, never hear if it was, if it was okay, it's okay. But boy, if it was not up to speed, you heard about it. And, and the cruelest thing you might get is, why did you turn the camera on? And that's really cuts right to your, you know, gets right into your gut to say, why did you turn the camera on? Uh, and, and you learn uh, patience and you learn to shoot in a way that, that's not what we call a video hog where you just turn on the camera. And, and that patience comes with a, at the same time you're wondering, am I gonna get a chance at that again? Is that behavior gonna happen again? I better turn the camera on or if it's, but the light's wrong, 
everything's raining or uh, you know you don't you're not close up the animal you, you can't even make a sequence and that's so important too how to shoot a sequence and that comes with with just experience knowing what what you need to give the editor to make a sequence that takes time because I had no clue on that you know when we see some great behavior going on you turn on the camera get in there you're just thrilled but take that to the edit room and they go well what else I've got one shot and the editor it, it's so important to work with the editors if you can sneak in the edit room if you have your own project or you're working on a project to grow as a cameraman you have to work in the edit room if you don't you can't because you'll make the same mistakes over and over again and then I hear these top editors in my ear whispering to me out in the field get that other shot Rick now get that shot now get that shot if he's got four shot or she has four she can cut something but just a great turn on the camera and it's happening in the battle at the water hole okay can't do anything more with that stop so so learning to shoot a sequence was so important uh, I had a lot of uh, setbacks I'm sure as I said when you you miss a shot a camera jams um, you know lost equipment or it wasn't what you saw through your eyepiece in your excitement in your whatever even though you're in control you look at it on the screen and say god it's not what I thought or it doesn't jump out at you I, I can tell you one really classical uh, experience I had and it was with the BBC and I was working with the head of the natural history unit at the time and, and his name is Dr. John Sparks, tough guy, and later we became great friends. But this was the first film under him through the natural world. And I was down in Costa Rica filming an open ocean film. And it was the first one about the open ocean that had been sort of commissioned. Because the word on the street was you couldn't do an open ocean film. You can't get close to marlin and tunas and all these animals to do a complete story. So. We're down there, we're set up on the Pacific coast, my sound man uh, assistant, and we have a nice house, and I've got a boat down there, fast boat. And the stuff was coming slowly, but it was there. So I sent in the first load of rushes, the first material. Didn't hear anything, and then I get a fax. This is the days of fax. We thought the fax machine was the greatest thing ever then. The fax came in on a Sunday morning, and my captain, who I'd been working with too, his wife calls me, and in this little village in Costa Rica. I said, oh, Rick, we've got a fax from Dr. Sparks for you. And I said, oh, great, read it to me. She says, oh, Rick, I don't know if I want to read this to you. And I said, what's the matter, Melissa? She said, well, it's not good. And <laughs> essentially, are you sitting down? But what John said to me after he'd looked at the first batch of material, he said, uh, oh, Rick, Rick, he said, if you would have showed me this load of crap before you left Bristol, I would have showed you the door. That's pretty tough. Now, that's, that's a real dagger in you. And, yeah, I had to sit down a bit. I don't think I would reach for the tequila bottle at that time. But, again, that's, again, you know, having a thick skin. So I then thought, okay, what did I send him? And I looked at our notes. Okay. I sent a fax back to John. I said, understand got it why don't you come down here and you know what he did he said a day later I'm coming to Costa Rica he got on a plane from you know Heathrow flew down to Costa Rica and then got a little little crop duster and flew down this little town we picked him up he came up to our our setup and I had a one of the best thing I did I put a radio a VHS marine radio in our in our um, in our cabin and an antenna on a, a roof where I could reach out 20 miles to the different boats. So we had a network going. We called it Sailfish Network. And the boats would knew what I was up to, and I had been friendly with them because I had filmed down there before and on a fishing program. And John's there, and we're talking. He still doesn't understand what the, what's the story. As luck would have it for me, and this happens many times in my career, the radio crackled in the morning. And the guys were calling, and they were down the coast about 20 miles, 30 miles. And they said, Rick, Rick, you know, come on. Man. Yeah, and they said, listen, a major thing part of your story, they didn't say it like that, 
was we were we were tracking some of the big floating trees that go along way out in the Pacific, the flotsam, and it attracts all this life around it. It's like a floating island, and it gathers animals as it goes. And they said, you better get down here because we just caught four marlin near the log. Turtles are on it, sea snakes, all the fishes, everything you talked about in your project is here on this 40-foot long tree. John's looking at me. We're having our breakfast. I said, okay, got to go. Dr. Sparks, uh, Dave Ruddick, myself, you know, get in the car, go down to the harbor, jump in my diving skiff, away we go. Hang on. We're going 30 miles an hour down the coast. We get down there in the, to, to the location. That was the days before GPS. We get down there, find it, start snorkeling around it, and it was just as the guys described. The animals were just coming and going like they were on a bus stop. And John Sparks got in the water with his snorkel, looked and looked at all this life, and and he got back in afternoon. We we stayed with this for for hours and hours, and it was just right in our story, just key. We got back to the marina, went up the house, and he said, "Got it right," and he said, uh, "Keep going. I'm going to see birds up in the mountains." And away from that on, we were great friends and he supported me and believed and uh, you know we would just stay stay the course and it became a called uh, hunters of the sea wind it became a sort of a classic in open ocean uh, storytelling so but that was a real tough start to have your boss tell you he would have showed you the door well it's extremely reassuring for myself and other filmmakers i'm sure to hear that someone as accomplished as yourself has had those kind of challenges and yet uh, kept going and, and got to the level you have and i think um the good advice from that is wh whatever happens just keep going because you know if you give up at any point in your life doing what you love doing then you're not going anywhere so now you have I mean, you, you've done many, many projects, and um, some most notably uh, filming on planet Earth, um, uh, Blue Planet, uh, Life, uh, and many, many more. Um, out of all of the things that you've done, is there any one thing that stands out to you. I, I know that um, with my filming experiences, I've done a lot of terrestrial work with mammals um, and insects and, and all sorts, but really the thing that stood out for me was uh, getting to dive and film with the sardine run um, off the coast of South Africa. And, and it was an incredible experience that, um, that can't be matched um, in my mind. Uh, is there anything from your career that stands out like that for you? Well, there's a number of high points, which is great. Uh, if, if we go back to Blue Planet, where the expectations were extremely high for that series, and, and uh, one of the, there was two things we needed uh, in, in the open ocean program was a, a cracker finale. I mean, we needed something. And uh, my boss at the time is uh, Alistair Fothergale, who was the executive of, of all those series and, and uh, and a super filmmaker, one of the best in the world. And, and he was hoping we would get something that would be, uh, you know, just, just stand out, knock out. And we were in the Azores in the middle of the Atlantic, and we were there for days and days, and I think it was our second trip back there. And previous to that, uh, the BBC shoot, I'd shot for National Geographic there and had done some work on bluefin tuna, the giant bluefins, and filmed the first giants and these animals are up to a thousand pounds tunas it's not charlie in the can it's a big big fish and filmed the first eat feeding in the wild with dolphins and the bbc was quite jealous of that they really wanted that kind of a show everybody would so the following a couple of years later we we started blue planet and and out there and it wasn't happening the tuna didn't show up uh, we were putting in our days on a sailing boat and coming back to port. And even the commercial tuna boat fishermen who range a couple hundred miles offshore with big binoculars and crews, they said the tuna aren't coming. And I called, I called Alistair after about 40 days. This is what the backing we had to do this and believe. And I said, what should we do, Al? And he said, well, I think you should stay with it, you know, I'm, and I don't know if it's going to happen. I was even thinking about other locations. Let's just say it. Well, again, luck would have it with Rick. 
you know, something dropped from the sky. And we'd come in to port that night on a Saturday night sitting at the, at the tavern outside by the marina. And a friend of mine who's a sport captain, sport fishing captain, walked by and he said, Rick, I think I saw a giant tuna jump off the lighthouse as I was coming back in. Nobody had seen any tunas at all that summer. And I went, really? And this guy was a very reliable fisherman, top notch. And these, this is so important for us as our, the information I gather from captains and others that really keep us uh, in tune at times. If they like you and, and they trust you and, and uh, you've worked with them before. So I said, right. So we talked to our crew. And I said, okay, we're leaving at 5 in the morning, out of port, Sunday morning. They all grumbled. And the port was asleep. Sleep, everybody's sleeping. No boats were out. We slipped out in a sailboat. Went out to this area off the lighthouse, off of the island of Fayal. And I said, right, let's just park the sailboat, meaning just let it drift, a big, bigger boat. And we're going to take our little Zodiac in off this spot and look. And we saw some birds and dolphins, but it didn't look at all special. And the sun was just coming up. We motored over there, and and, uh, my assistant at the time is Doug Anderson, who's become quite an accomplished uh, filmmaker and a cameraman for BBC, one of the top guys. Then he was just supposed to help out, run the boat, keep me from uh, getting swallowed by some animal. So we motored over real slowly and stopped and waited, and the dolphins or something, I could see a few, and I said, I'm going to check it out. So I just rolled in the water with a big movie camera again, and a big yellowfin tuna swam by me. I mean about a 250-pound fish and another. And I put my head above water to Doug, and I said, they're here. And I got back into Zodiac, and we saw birds acting, you know, over the water, fluttering and chasing some bait, whatever. So we started following and moving slowly. And it's and it told a sailboat on the radio, stay where you are. No other boats out, just stay where you are. Don't make any noise and commotion. It started to build. Like the word got out to every bird, every shearwater, Cory shearwater in, in the islands, thousands appeared. It was the biggest bait ball ever. If they call it a bait ball, this was just a tornado of birds and the dolphins starting to assemble. How the word gets around, I have no idea, because it goes from a couple of birds, and, and they're not all scouting. The word got out, and you look down the horizon, it was black with birds. It's like any other thing we'd ever seen. And we knew that the bait was there, too, and the mackerel, sardines. And so we motor up to one's areas that we thought looked promising for a diver and a camera to get in, and it was just the whole show open before our eyes. This was carouseling dolphins, uh, the bait fish, the, the shearwaters diving 50, 60 feet down to snatch, you know, bait fish right out of the tuna's mouth. And it was looking up at that, you know, those are the shots, the ending of all the Blue Planet area. You have the birds, the dolphins, the tunas, all working together the way the ocean was maybe intended to, to, to behave and, and work. and. I had a movie camera underwater and one on the surface, and we had to work very carefully back and forth so we had enough time to load the camera, and Doug drove the boat. He would hang over the Zodiac and look down into this because the water was really clear. It was just magic. And that, when we sent that footage back after 40 days, I got the call, and I think it was on the satellite phone. BBC was ecstatic. That was it. They even took it to the laboratory right away under lock and key, hid it under their beds, or wherever it went. But that's the whole finale of, of the uh, B- B- uh, Blue Planet as well as the, the feature film Deep Blue. So there's one of the highlights that I remember. I see it's burned in my brain. Yeah, that's that sounds phenomenal, and um, yeah, I can totally relate to that. Having obviously watched Blue Planet and seen that footage, like I'm sure many listeners have, um, it's absolutely awesome. Um, now, in terms of the gear you use, uh, I'm sure you've used many cameras throughout your career. Um, something that we're seeing now, obviously, with technology is you know technology is moving so fast. Cameras are coming out every few months, and um, the the, the 
kind of coined phrase gear envy is happening uh, you know everywhere you look where people are, are desperate to get the latest and greatest and um, uh, most of the time they want to do that before they really have any real work or they're bringing in money and obviously it can finish you before you've started. What, um, tell us a bit about the equipment you use but also you know, what advice do you have for people who are starting out and um, uh, just starting in the filming world with regards to all this new technology? Well, the, the, the technology and the breakthroughs and the speed is just uh, mind-boggling, driving us all crazy because, you know, it's a flavor of the, every six months we got to change or, oh, the broadcasters want this or that. And, you know, we've moved to high definition to, to 4K to where that's going to go. Uh, to a camera person, it's costing us a heck of a lot of money and confusion uh, knowing that we to play the game you have to have the the right gun and at the same time you know if you're starting out can you really make an investment like that and have very little work or no work or a few assignments I don't think you can because you're gonna go immediately into debt at the same time you gotta have that piece of equipment to get to work so it's definitely a catch-22 um, I don't think you have to have the top, top uh, kit to find the work, uh, to demonstrate, you know, your abilities. Uh, some of the crossover cameras, these Canon the DSLRs, whatever, the 5D Mark III now or IV, are, are, are putting out some powerful images. Sony has some smaller cameras now that are shooting HD and 4K. Uh, the, the, the Sony, the small little Sony that's out, the S, what is it, the, the, the 7S, whatever, Mark II, uh, is, is a brilliant little camera, what you get out of it. It's astounding what these cameras are doing. Will that be accepted on world broadcasts? Maybe not. But you still have to have that to demonstrate to people. So maybe at times renting some gear, but that's very expensive too. That's the trouble with, with cameramen that do documentary natural history. We can't rent our gear because we're out in the field so long. The rentals are too expensive. It's not like LA, New York, Vancouver, or whatever, London, where you can just run by and pick up your kit, and come back in, you've got a problem. You've got to have the whole deal. So it is a real conundrum, and I'm a little... Uh, irritated by let's say guys that go out and get a red kit and then they're they're already uh, putting their sign out that they're a director of photography because they have the red system that doesn't make you a, a top cinematographer or they're not a videographer uh, maybe it's it, it, it's the first piece of it but you still got to know what the hell you're doing and and uh, so image quality is very important, but the skill behind it is, uh, is even more important. And, and you, you, maybe you have to wait your turn, you know? It, it's a slow process, and again, patience, just like when you're shooting. Uh, you gotta have the patience. You can't just expect you're gonna break right through as a young camera person, and for everybody to be ready for you. The, the truth of the matter is there's too many. There's too many people out there with skills. The world has changed, you know, there's just, it's true of every field, but there's always room for good people and that have passion, patience, persistence. That's my three P's for, for being a good wildlife cameraman. But uh, the gear, I can't answer that uh, any more than, than others. I'm in the same boat. Time to get another piece of kit. I had one camera a few years ago that was a $100,000 body and Five years later, it was worth zero. The viewfinder was $13,000, let alone the lenses and then the custom underwater housing. So I had about $180,000 invested in that kit, and, and nothing was worth uh, after five years except a couple of lenses I sold that then couldn't be used in you know, what we're doing today. So it may be the best alternative is to get work with one of the crossover cameras and, and, and shoot with those and the housings if you're going to go underwater are a lot more reasonably priced. But then use those same lenses as you step it up. Tripods are still tripods. Quality glass is still going to be quality glass, the lenses. But 
Where this is all going, I have no idea. I didn't know there would ever be such a thing as tapeless or filmless, you know, on a little memory card. Uh, but um, at the same time, you got to make a you got to make the jump somewhere. So maybe maybe getting on a mid level is a little better way to go and show your skills. Yeah, I think that's great advice, and and uh, definitely hone your skills before you go out spending large bucks trying to trying to get the gear. Um, now. We're at the festival. You have a film in the festival this year, The Dark Side of the Ocean. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about that film and uh, where it was filmed and, uh, and what it's about. Yeah, the Dark Side of the Ocean is about the great vertical migration of animals in the ocean, particularly out in the deep sea, midwater, that, that occurs. This migration is, is, happens every night, and these animals are queuing off light 1% of the available light level that reaches down into their world, they kind of uh, cue on that, and that's their framework, and that's what they orient on, a trigger. And that a lot of the animals, or most that live in the deep sea, in the midwater, they have to come up at certain times during the day to feed. The food is up near where the light is, in that euphotic zone, down to about... Uh, you know, 200 feet, something like that. And, and that's where the plankton is. That's where the small fish are. That's where uh, it happens. It's pretty meager pickings at depth. So as a marine animal, whatever your, your you know, whatever phylum, whatever group you're in, you, you probably have to make some connection to the surface. But maybe it's safer to come up in darkness. And during the day, and, and uh, bright sunlight, you hide down in the shadow land, in the twilight zone. This has been known for a long time, and it was called the deep scattering layer. Uh, the military navies of the world knew about it because when they would do their depth soundings, sonar work, they would bounce sound down and get a recording back up, and it wasn't the bottom. It was a false bottom. A lot of the charts in the world are actually uh, done wrong, the marine charts. There aren't those high sea mountains or banks offshore. Those are living animals. But when the ships passed over the top of them doing their depth soundings, they recorded what they thought was terra firma down there, the sea bottom, the seabed. In fact, it was layers of animals so dense that the sound would bounce off and return back to the, to the uh, technician on the ship. And, and he'd write it down or chart it. Oh, in the chart. The charts are wrong in a lot of parts of the world. Those were animals, living animals, in different groups of animals, from gelatinous animals like jellies and tinafores and all these things to squids to small fish, lanternfish. And, it, and those layers move, and they move with the light levels. So, so the navies of the world were taking advantage of this. Oh, a good place to hide your submarine underneath that. Let's park that underneath that layer, and the ship above wouldn't pick you up, detect you. And as a young biologist, I worked on some of this in San Diego with some of the early researchers trying to figure out what those animals were and what was going on down there with, with uh, small research submarines, as well as plankton toes and classical stuff. So uh, I was intrigued by it. Uh, certainly, but then you're just looking out a little porthole and you got to see something and taking some still photographs and a lot more was going on down there. So I kind of put that aside and one of my bosses was one of the top guys in that field. And, and as I went off to do my other marine biology work, it wasn't in my, you know, it wasn't on the radar at that time uh, or on the sonar at that time. It was more, I was working in shallower waters. And, and reef work and kelp forest. But then working, pushing out into the open ocean in my career to film out there, you know, when the sun would go down, we all knew. Turn on a light, whatever, you're out there sitting, rocking out in a boat offshore, and wow, what's that coming up? What's that animal? We suddenly see a whole new cast of characters coming up and some real alien looking things. But, you know, we didn't have the gear that could film it as well. We, we attempted it. Uh, and our lights weren't as, weren't as uh, you know, they weren't as friendly. The lighting packages weren't as friendly. So as I went along and tried to do some programs on the, the giant marlin and swordfish, sailfish called superfish, and then we got in the water and 
In that, I had proposed I'd film a baby sailfish or marlin. Well, I was told, again, by one of the broadcasters, how the hell do you think you're going to go out in the open ocean 30 miles offshore and film something three inches long, a needle in a haystack, in the dark, at night, end of story? Well, you know what? It's in our program. We swam with baby sailfish as they came up into the shallows at night into the, and to feed. And they're just miniature, perfect little sailfish with a sail and everything. That really got us a lot of horsepower because we came through to do that. I had seen them and I felt we could film them, so it wasn't just a, you know, I, I wasn't just dreaming it. But to see it one night and we're in the water by the boat and these little baby miniatures were coming up, sailfish, and we're just like, another you know leaf dropped down from from above that's helped my career a lot and it helped make that whole film uh, we were we were we set out to film the greatest giant marlin on the planet the grander the thousand pounder that Hemingway talked about in the old man in the sea he didn't film it we did off Australia free swimming with them but the baby gave us the one that the audience really liked the the film is just spectacular, and um, and hearing you speak about you know leaves dropping from above and the kind of the luck that you have filmmaking, I think we can probably agree that you only get that kind of luck when you're out there putting the time in and, and looking for these things and filming, and um, uh, you know without going out there and spending that time, it, it just doesn't happen. You're also working on another project, um, El Nino. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that one? In terms of uh, new projects, um, I've always been intrigued by the El Nino phenomenon, and we're experiencing that around the world right now. Droughts, fires, Houston is flooded, England flooded for a while, South Africa, severe drought, uh, famine in some areas, fires in Indonesia, California, giant waves along the coast. Uh, Seattle got record rain, record in Portland and Vancouver, and that's a lot of rain if they get a record. Um, and, and so when we have this El Nino phenomenon, and it goes back and forth, and it's always been going on, it's not global warming, it's a natural phenomenon, event in the Pacific Ocean that happens out in the central Pacific where it starts, and it's ocean and atmosphere, and it's based a lot on when the winds drop or the winds pick up and water temperatures uh, change. And we were seeing this condition, and I've been through a number of El Ninos in California, and that this past one, the one that's currently going on, it's, it's one of the biggest ever, maybe. So, so we started to see this warm water in 2014, and, and temperatures we hadn't seen, uh, elevations going up, and tropical animals moving in. We were seeing marlin and sharks and turtles. And, uh, so, so I thought, it's time to do an El Nino story. But let's do it before the scientists, the NOAA, the climate guys, the meteorologists, actually, actually then put their stamp on and say, yes, it's an El Nino. And we had all the signs that it was happening. So we started to film in California and, and in Costa Rica where it's intense down there, water temperatures 88 to 91 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, that's bath water. We expected all the animals to be galloped away and been gone from that area in Costa Rica. Instead, we found this giant gathering life down there in a 50 mile area, and, and it was a, a happening. Uh, what we're finding out today with, with this sea temperatures rising everywhere, and particularly in the Pacific, that our knowledge about the ocean is going to be almost thrown out the window. And I think it's going to happen on land, too. All those things that we've learned as the, as the world heats up, as the earth heats up, uh, and the climate changes, we're going to have to renew. We're going to have to rethink. We're going to have to be retrained. And, and hopefully the animals, a lot of them, and some of these ecosystems, can, can adapt uh, to this. And many won't. But... The El Nino, La Nina phenomenon, and La Nina is in the normal year, the cooling years. El Nino is in the more warm years when the water temperatures get warm off the Americas, coast of the Americas, and, and that hot water bleeds up the coast from Peru and, and causes all this change, including weather changes. So that's our newest project, and we want to tell it as a mystery story 
because we still don't know what El Nino, we know about it, uh, but we can't predict it all the time. The intensity and then the warning signs are out. Will El Nino come more frequently and will it even become permanent? If that happens then in the Pacific, that changes our world's weather. And, and to the lay person anywhere on the planet, when you're looking outside, you better think about El Nino because that, be, that may be what's happening in your backyard. And, and when you get that big rain or you don't get it, or the crops fail or you have to learn to adjust to it, there's something happening way out in the Pacific Ocean that's causing that. And that's, what's, that's a mystery to a lot of people. They don't think about that at all. And, and we want to know more about it, and we're trying to tell that story as an ocean mystery. Well, that sounds absolutely fascinating, and um, I'll be eager to see that film when, when you've got that complete and, and out. Um, it's probably appropriate for us to, to talk about the film festival circuit and uh, what that means to you, what it, what it does for you and your films uh, as we're sat here at the International Wildlife Film Festival. How important are these festivals for your films and your career? I have mixed feelings about some of the film festivals. Um, I like the ones that are community-based, where the community really participates and looks at your work and comments. Um, there are other festivals that are much more business-oriented, and you get a chance to rub elbows with the broadcasters and possibly sell your work or find somebody that, that is interested in your work. Those are important. Early in anyone's career, I don't care what your age is, I, I think you better go to some of these festivals. Because one contact may change everything for you. And it may be a way for you to show something to someone that won't answer your email or your phone call. And, and people don't like to call anymore, or certainly your text message. But there's nothing like looking somebody right in the eye and talking to them. And some ideas. And, and sharing ideas. You know, I've never been paranoid about some of the ideas that I have to worry about somebody else is going to go do it. It's been a lot more good luck. Go get them. If you want to jump in that giant bait ball out there, then if you can find it, go find it. You know? so, so I get a lot out of just some exchanges with a few people. The, the maddening thing about them is, is that most festivals have too many people. And we can't raise our hand and just say, who are you? What are you doing? Okay, let's meet, talk. That would be very helpful instead of just milling around. Um, my wife, and she's the partner and the producer of our films, Katya Shiraco, gets a lot out of them because she's doing business and, and, and encourages me and even kicks me in the butt to come to these uh, because she'll say, look, we met this individual, that. And, but I, I, am, I like Missoula because of the community base of it. It's gotten much smaller in terms of the delegates and the business end aside, and they're trying to grow the community side. And I think that's really important. Uh, you know, some of them are are very expensive, and you need to know uh, is that going to be worth it for you. But it is a way to 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 measure up what you how you you're doing your work, what kind of gear you're using. Sometimes they have workshops, which are great. Uh, they have industry displays, what kind of gear is out there. Uh, as well as uh, maybe pitch pitch your show and hustle it. And, and today you can show somebody on a clip in two minutes. Don't bore them showing your boring, uh, showing their, your movie. Put a little sizzler together, a little clip, something that teases someone and says, this is what I do. Uh, and, and then if they want to see more complete work, they'll ask for it. But that helps. Better have it on your iPad and you better have it real quick because everybody's kind of you know, bothered by it, but to just sit and expect them to take your DVD like in the old days and look at it. No, it's better to follow up, follow it up later, and and to stay on it. You know, I've had a number of 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 uh, folks in the business that then I met, they met me, and then they they didn't bug me. They just called me and you know sent me some stuff, and we thought about it, and and either I had somebody that in mind that they could work with or it, it, it looked like they might have a position, might have some kind of an opportunity. I don't do interns with people. We pay them. If we can't pay them because I believe then I can fire them or they can quit and not as an intern and go off grumpy and it didn't work out. So 
I know the intern thing is rampant through the business, but I'd much rather pay somebody something and then say, well, did you like it? Did you not? You're going to leave. Uh, stay on. You really have potential. I think you're great. And and uh, I've got a young guy working for me now that I, I didn't meet at a festival. He came to one of our talks, and he now is just top. And he He's you know, learn to edit really well. He shoots. He can drive a boat. He's got a strong science background, and he's a people person, and he communicate, and and he's what we talked about uh, earlier. Um, you know, he's, he'll take on other jobs. He'll he, he'll tackle things, even if he fails for a while, and he just learns and gets into it. So the festivals are very important, especially incoming newbies, newcomers there unfortunately the older types have been in get a little jaded and they kind of go oh i've been to that i've been to that i've been to that and the expense you know wild screens very expensive to go to jackson holes very expensive to go to they're both the big the biggies and yet there's some like like missoula or we go to green screen in germany uh, and that's terrific the whole community is participating in a seaport town and great food and uh, talks and they're not doing any business and the delicate fee is $45 but the whole community comes out and about 15,000 people watch your films and they pay to watch it you don't get the money but and they have a walk of stars where if you are winning film you have a star in the, in the walkway by the pier by the harbor and you walk along and it's kind of neat to step on a Rick Rosenthal star <laughs> And the TV stations come out, but they they do it through the communities, and and you can see it works. And there's an energy with the not so much the delegates that go with the community. They make it a real event every year, a happening. And I think that's just really neat. And you're welcomed, and it doesn't matter about the language issue. Uh, they have translators there for some of the talks, and and I think to me that's a model that it can work. And it's a heck of a lot of work for those people, but they court the businessmen and the businesses. Hey, put up some money to help this, an award. Some of the prizes are 2,000 euros for a top film, not just some little plastic trophy. So, so that encourages some top filmmakers to enter. You know, you dangle that. Now, if it's real and you really pay off, there are some other festivals that, that offer these big prizes, not film festival, not, not wildlife documentaries and it's uh, it's all BS you know they say oh we have a hundred thousand dollar prize well nobody's ever won it <laughs> I won't say the name of the festival but so really scrutinize those festivals and with your other colleagues and content is that worth it while for me Rick thank you so much for taking time out today to be on the show um, very quickly where could people go online to find out more about your projects well, I do have a website, which is already new, and it's uh, Rick Rosenthal, R I C K R O S E N T H A L A L dot net. And that takes you to my website, and it'll take you to also Wild Logic's website about the programs we've done or uh, contacting us, uh, what we've got going on, uh, talks, awards, and we're trying to update that. and. I know I should be blogging. I know I should be on Instagram, and I'm an old dinosaur, but uh, I may be, may be doing that in the future. But there are ways to contact us and, and to see what we're up to. Fantastic. Rick, it's an absolute honor to meet you. And again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be with us. Uh, superb, really nice to delve into some of your work there and, and hear what you've been up to. Thanks again. Thanks for the time. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, then please leave a rating and a comment. And remember to subscribe to keep up to date with the series. You can find out more information on wildlife filmmaking at masterwildlifefilmmaking.com, where you'll find valuable free resources like downloadable reports and video tutorials. Thanks for listening.